two times on him. He's got a cold. Very good. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, you're wrong. Praise God. Children's Church. Children's Church are dismissed. Wait a minute. I was talking to Lord. No doubt, Mark can do that. That's not a problem. We can take care of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, good to be here today. <laughs> Everybody raise your hand toward Brother Burton this morning. Father God, we just praise you and thank you for Brother Burton this morning. And Lord, we pray that you bless him and anoint him right now man, with your precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Are you all able to hear me out there now? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, like I say, it's good to be here. Pastor asked me right after Christmas time, could I come and talk today? And I said, yeah, I'll be here. And uh, like I found me a subject lesson that I wanted to talk about. So I said, well, how am I going to introduce that? So I found a little poem. Oh, three or four days ago, and I read it, and it said, "Well, that might interest. That might touch somebody's mind and heart." I'm just looking at the heart today, but mine. But it's a little poem called "A Boy and His Doll." It was a poem written by Marty Hall. It says, "I want my boy to have a doll, or maybe two or three. He'll learn from them much easier." And he will learn from me. A dog will teach you how to love and bear no grudge nor hate. I'm not so good at that myself, but a dog will do it straight. There never yet has been a dog that learned to double cross. They'll cater to you when you won, they'll drop you when you're lost. I want my dog boy to have a dog to be his pal and friend. So he will learn that friendship is faithful to the end. And so when I tell you what my subject is, don't get the idea of trying to compare you to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but this dog can show you something that you might not even realize, not even think about. This subject I'm speaking on today is was a result of a, a men's Bible study we had at the Church of God in Greenland back in November. <clears throat> and we're going to find out that forgiveness is what my subject is. Forgiveness. You can see that little puppy. You get a little puppy character to the house. <clears throat> he run in the living room and turn your best face over uh, knock something over and you scroll him and maybe hit him on the back with a paper or well, he'll get all scrunched down and he's hurt. But all you got to do is go back to him and rub him on the head and talk real sweet to him, pat him on the back, you get up and walk off and boom, boom, you can't hardly walk, he's all over your feet. <laughs> he's forgiven, he's recognized forgiveness. And this is what we've got to learn to do more so than what we're doing that now. Forgiveness is the key to spiritual health and growth. Luke 6.37 says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. See, we were man commanded by Christ to be forgiving of others. Jesus said, and you will recognize this from a prayer we say a lot. And forgive not our debtors as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you your trespasses. <clears throat> and it goes on. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, this is a key, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That's setting the tone right there. Jesus said, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Possibly go to him and tell him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. That's what it's all about.
Apostle Paul also addressed that same subject. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You can't have mercy for yourself and won't want justice for others. So we'll go along right now and I'll train my pages here. Let's listen to Jesus, what he said. You'll recognize this. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Greatest injustice that ever happened in this world. The greatest example of forgiveness. Amen. All of those men that were there and all those that beat on them and all, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. No one can say that their personal injustice is too much to forgive. Jesus knows because in verse chapter 23, 53, he knows what it is to be left behind, to be canceled, I mean to um, expose, rejected, or wounded, all of these things he had to go through. So he has to forgive them, Father. And so how did it, that occur to us? He shed his blood on the cross for you and me. Amen. To forgive him. Forgiveness is a big deal for Jesus. It's the heart of the gospel. Meaning of give, forgive, leave behind the castle of debt. Now we'll go ahead and I'll talk to you about the story of Joseph. Most every one of you in Sunday school and probably through preaching have heard somebody preach about Joseph. The young boy that got on his father made him a coat of many colors. And let's take what take go through Joseph's life a little bit. He's the son of Jacob. Jacob had twelve wives and twelve sons. I mean, five wives and twelve sons. I'll get it straight here. And uh, Joseph was the eleventh one of those boys that were born. He had a brother, younger brother named Benjamin, that he was pretty much in love with and concerned. But let's go ahead and see what that story is. The story of Joseph is forgiveness exemplified. You will see it throughout this section here. Now when we start off, it goes from verse, I mean chapter 30, verse 3, 24, Joseph was born to Rachel. But then we're going to come to chapter 37. Joseph was 17 years old at that point, and he was a favorite son of Jacob. Jacob made him a coat of many colors. Because of that, he was hated by his brothers. Jacob never made him a coat or anything like that. It was something special. And also, Joseph was a dreamer. He had a couple of dreams, but I'll tell you one of them. He dreamed there was a shed of wheat tied up in there and bum, stand, standing up. And all the way around it were lead and shoes just like it bowed down to him. And he interpreted that as, and told his brothers, says, that's me in the middle, and y'all are y'all bowed down, uh, worshiping me. Well, that makes them matter still. They were very, very angry at him. They didn't like him. One day, Jacob sent Joseph out to the field to check on his brothers who had the, the sheep and stuff like that, animals. They had to search the desert to find the grass and have a place for them to graze and then move them to somewhere else. So one day Jacob told, sent Jason out to check on his brothers. And they saw him coming and they began to conspire, so conspire how they could murder Joseph, get rid of him. But the oldest brother stood up and said, no, wait a minute, we can't do that. We can't do that. Let's, let's put him in this pit over here until we figure out what we do want to do with it. So Joseph, about that time a caravan came by and somebody had some slaves on it and they said, we'll sell Joseph into slavery. So they sold him in there like about 20 shekels or something into as a slave in that caravan and he was taken to Egypt. Jacob is deceived. That's the daddy. They didn't know what to do, but they had uh, 
God chose this coat of many colors and went out and slew a little lame lamb and sprinkled her blood on the lamb and went back and told her daddy. Said it must have been a lion come out and got him and drug him off in the desert. We couldn't find him. He's gone. We don't know what happens. So Joseph, of course, Jacob was very upset. But Joseph, they carried him on to Egypt and he was sold to Potiphar. Potiphar was one of the officers in Pharaoh's army. He had his own house, he had his own slaves. And so they sold Joseph to this Potiphar as a slave. And he went into the house there at age 17. <coughs> Joseph's life in slavery in prison. In the prison there, well, let me get that a little further. He hadn't got to do the prison yet. In slavery, he was elevated to the head of Potiphar's household, then sent to prison. Why did he get sent to prison? Potiphar's wife lusted after him from the time he went in the house there. And in the house, it says here, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord had all made him did to prosper, and Joseph found grace in his sight. So that's when he was elevated to the head of Potiphar's household. All the slaves were under him, and he was a slave. But anyway, he was going to carry on there. His wife, one day after Joseph, and he ran off and she pulled his coat off of him. And when Potiphar got home, she said, that Hebrew slave that you hired, boy, he's been after me ever since he's been here. And she had him believe it. Somebody said, well, Potiphar never knew what was going on anyway. But he had to keep face the other uh, slaves couldn't see him not doing the right thing, so he sent him to the prison, to Pharaoh's for prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. He showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisons that were in the prison. Look not anything not that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. The Lord made him the prisoner to prosper. An example for Christians today, in adversity, stay faithful. Don't give up. Amen. And there was Joseph the prisoner there with, in the, with the Pharaoh. And while he was in the, when the uh, prison, he worked he was with the cooks and the bakers. And he saw him one day and he said, Wherefore look you so sad today? And they said, we have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said, do not interpretation belong to God? Tell me then, I pray you. And Joseph interpreted the dream to them. Later on, those that baker and the cook there in the, that prison found favor, and they were sent, favor was sent for them to go to his cook, kitchen. And the baker was there, and he was, they made food for Pharaoh's family and stuff. But at the time, the man got ready to leave the prison. 40, chapter 40, verse 14, Joseph said, But think on me when it shall be well with you, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For well, indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon. Our teacher told us there, so that's the only record of Joseph showing frustration and pain over his being confined and what have you. But the chief butler, when he got into prison, I mean in the kitchen where Joseph and Pharaoh came, he didn't remember him. He forgot him. And two years after that, and it came to pass at the end of two full years, Pharaoh really dreamed. And he slept and dreamed the second time. Then the chief butler remembered Joseph. And he says, And there was there with us a young man, a Hebrew, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. And 
And it came to pass as he interpreted us, so it was. So the Pharaoh was sent and called Joseph. They brought him to get ready to bring him to Pharaoh. And they brought him hastily out of the temple. <coughs> then he shaved himself, changed his raiment, and came in unto Pharaoh. From Potiphar's, Potiphar's house to Pharaoh's house. That was 13 years of development there from the time being 17 years old to 30 years old. And Joseph asked his Pharaoh, saying, when he told him about that, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer to his, to his dream. A, pre, a Hebrew prisoner advises Pharaoh. That's something to think about. Then from prison to second in command of Egypt, the power of a pure heart not tinged by unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, hatred, malice, self-pity, will find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And as 46 says, And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. There had to be a, a right many different tribes and stuff throughout all of that. Egypt is a big country. And he had to go out to those and meet those people and let them know who he was. He probably had a, a charade of chariots and everybody riding with him. Here he was, a second in command of Pharaoh. And he had to let them people know who he was. Pharaoh's dream was, we're going to have seven years of plenty, seven years of uh, famine. And uh, he interpreted that dream to mean seven years of plenty, the crops are gonna grow good. That means that and it's gonna be seven years of nothing, there's nothing to grow. And that means that they had to start building barns and all, that's what they said to do. The old barns and store the grain so we'll have something to do seven bad, bad years. Now we'll get into the famine brings his brothers to Egypt. This famine and famine affected the Hebrews and all the people who weren't just on Egypt itself. And that has been uh, well, that was 20 years since they sold Joseph in this labor. And here we can see the heart of Joseph. They said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the anguish of his, his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Our last member of Joseph was his pleading for his life. And they were there when they got to his Jacob's told us. His, Boys, hook up the wagons and go down to Egypt and see if you can buy some grain, buy some stuff we can make some bread with and what have you. That was two years after they said famine was over with. And uh, they came down and of course they went right straight to the second in command, who was Joseph. Joseph recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. And after they'd been there a while talking, it says here, and Joseph turned himself about from them and wept. Suffering no matter how unfair, develops a strong character and wisdom. And there's a lot of good that goes on. He gave them to get, told them to get some uh, grain and put it in the bags. But he also had them told his slaves to go and get some fine. I guess vessels and whatever, pitchers and what have you, and pack it in the grain in the bag. But the boys started back to the Hebrews land, and they opened their bags to see how they got, and they found all this silver and gold in it. They got scared. Oh, Lord, we got to carry this back. They think we robbed this stuff. And they went back to Joseph there before they ever got home with that stuff. And Joseph could not, when they got back, the boy was talking to him, Chapter 45, verse 45 says, 
And Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. Here is a Christ likeness of Joseph. He says, Come here to me, I pray, talking to his brother. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me. God did send me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve you a prosperity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So, forgiveness, a Christ-like example and model. So now it was not you that sent me here, though this is verse 8 in chapter 45. So now it was not you that sent me here, but God. And he had made me a follower to, eat, to Pharaoh, and Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste you and go up to my father, and say to him, Thus saith my son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto us, tarry not. See here, Joseph dealt with rejection, jealousy, resentment, kidnapping, slavery, prison, overcome evil, but he still made a tolerant right relationship with God through all of it. Here he was made better, not bitter. Most of us would have got real bitter and been really upset. Joseph's story goes from chapter 27 through chapter 50, verse 26. He was a slave and a prisoner from age 17 to 30. And from age 30 to 110, he was governor of Egypt. He died at 110 years old. That was 80 years of high privilege. Looking at this from a little perspective, here was a famous favorite son and dreamer who was hated by his brothers. He became a murder target, but he ended up being a Mennonite slave. Then he came in as a Potiphar slave. He was a prisoner of dreamed interpretation. There he was standing before Pharaoh, interpreting his dreams. He was promoted as governor, provided for his brothers, reconciles his family, and brings his family all over to Egypt. And during this process, if you read that whole chapter and everything, when he got there, Pharaoh told him, carry him out and give him the best land to live on his probably on the river bank of the Nile River. But anyway, they got the best of everything, and they were good. And so let us make a little statement today to all of you. God's will for my life, not, not God's will for my life, rather, my life for God's will. I got it backwards. It was Joseph's knowledge of dreams that had helped him interpret their meaning. It wasn't really. It was his knowledge of God. <clears throat> Joseph's forgiveness, he rejected any personal right to withhold forgiveness and exact vengeance. He says, I'm in the place of God. What should I do? Three ways to take God's place. Hold a grudge and keep an account. Holy grudge and keep an account of, of wrongs, or to retaliate, or to exact vengeance. So he was rejected in all of these things, kidnapped and slavery in prison, yet he forgot not his brothers and shared his prosperity with them. Forgiveness. That's the theme of the New Testament. Forgiveness. We must forgive others. Unforgiveness is one of the biggest prisoners poisons that hinder our deliverance. Unforgiveness brings you to the place of torment. I love scripture for all of these, but I want to say, tell you what it is there. Unforgiveness prevents God from forgiving us. Unforgiveness can block God from asking our prayer. Unforgiveness can affect us mentally and physically. Forgiveness brings healing to you and others. Matthew 22, 37, 44 is the great commandment, but I haven't gotten it down, I haven't looked it up to read it. 
Unforgiveness can give Satan an advantage, and unforgiveness can keep you out of heaven. There again is that statement that we need to really take to heart. What does it mean to forgive? Forgiveness means to release one from a debt owed. We owe God a debt of our, for our sins. He, he shed his blood so we could get forgiveness. Spiritually, God releases us from our debt of sin. As Christians, we are the most forgiven, given people in the world. We should therefore be the most forgiving people in the world. Amen. Put that one to think about. Forgiveness is the foundation upon which God reveals a believer in redemption, reconciliation, and relationships. Forgiveness is one of the nearest things to Christ's likeness we can do. Naturally, Satan will attack you in that area of forgiveness. And we just have to remember, but Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. No matter what happens, kind of sum it up a little bit, forgiveness is not, well, let's pretend it never happened. It's not a demand that a person change before you forgive. It is not forgetting it happened. Thinking that time alone will heal the hurt. Emotions are never buried dead. They are buried alive. So you've got to get that out of your body before the good Lord strikes you dead. For some happens anyway. You've got to choose to live, to forgive, I mean. This is a good one. Holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You've got to be careful. Remember, you can learn from the way the dog acted and accept the idea you can be forgiven and you've got to give forgiveness. And uh, that was my point I was trying to make with that little poem. But that pretty well covers what we have here. I was talking with Steve before. Did you have anything else you want to carry on in the meeting before you said? This will be the shortest sermon you've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I used to hear people say, you go to church, they read a poem, say a little prayer, and just come on home and preach a little bit. So I need to say a little bit more, but that's all I got. So, uh, anyway, you can go home and enjoy yourself. But we've got to remember, God is in charge. He knows control of all of it. And did you boys have anything to sing a song at the end or anything? No? Okay. Because they live. Well, I'm going to close this, and you all can all stand, and we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. And in the Lord's Prayer, you're going to see why being forgiven and blessing. Let's pray. Our Father, Father who is which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.